Hey folks, I'm Gene Della Sala with Audioholics, and today we have a special guest. We have Mr. Shane Rich, the technical director, I think your title still is, at RBH Sound. Is that correct, Shane? That is correct. Good to be with you, Gene. I'm glad to always have you here, my friend. I always like talking speaker talk with you, and I figured I'd have you back on our channel to do another video. We're going to talk about exotic materials in loudspeakers. Do they make a difference in sound quality and performance? That's the topic I'd like to discuss with you, Shane, and, and try to give a definitive answer to our viewership here on Audioholics. Yes. Well, I look forward to discussing it, and it's wonderful to be back with you. Uh, we always have a great time talking about these uh, types of things. Um, and I, I think maybe the place to start might be the actual advent of the loudspeaker itself. What do you think? That sounds like a good place to start. Uh, before we do that, I just want to tell people, normally we would have been doing this as a live stream, but thanks Thanks to YouTube, they've gotten rid of Google Hangouts on you, on, uh, as an option for live streaming now. So until I find a decent program, we're using this program called Zoom, and it does a lot of compression. So please be kind. We're just trying to get the message out. I don't want to delay us getting videos done. So deal with the quality levels, my friends. It's the message that counts. So with that said, let us proceed. I guess you want to talk about kind of the history of loudspeakers and yeah. You know, some influences in the industry and stuff like that. I'll let you have the mic, my friend. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's worth going right back to the beginning. If we start with the initial patent for a sound producing apparatus, which was filed in January of 1925. And this was filed by uh, Edward Kellogg, who worked for General Electric at the time. Uh, he worked with another gentleman, uh, I just remember his last name is Rice, and uh, between the two of them, they basically came up with the, uh, what we know now as uh, the dynamic uh, loudspeaker. So I'm going to share this with you, if I can figure out how to push the right button here. So I wonder, the Kellogg name, is that related to the serial, or is that just a coincidence? You know, I wondered the same thing myself. I honestly don't know. I, I probably should have uh, looked to see if that was the case. So let's take a look at this. Uh, can you see this on your screen now? Yes, <laughs> I do. Yeah. So this is, you know, pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> Up until this time, uh, let's see if I can keep this zoomed in. It'll be a little easier to, to see here. So up until this time, as you well remember, uh, we had things like the Edison uh, uh, horn, and uh, they were primarily using a stylus that would move along some type of cylinder. That stylus was... Uh, uh, or needle was attached to a diaphragm and the diaphragm moved um, and resonated according to essentially think of it as like the record grooves in a record and then that that diaphragm uh, without any additional uh, electric form of amplification was broadcast out into the room through a horn uh, and so that was that was how people were listening um, up until the advent of the dynamic loudspeaker. And well, so, Shane, I'm glad that I'm glad that you remember that. You're obviously a lot, you're obviously a lot older than me. I wasn't around then, so I'm sorry, my friend. I can't relate. Yeah, well, I, I guess I can't relate either, other than what I have learned about it. But but it is real fascinating history. And uh, what's particularly interesting about what Kellogg um, patented here is that if you'll notice, and it's kind of hard to see uh, on the screen, but we, we see there's a cone. We see it's attached, actually in this case, to a magnet. Uh, and so there was a moving magnet inside of a stationary coil which, you know, is just uh, 
that's not the way it usually happens. Now we have a fixed magnet and a moving coil. But uh, the concept is basically still the same. You move a current through uh, the windings and uh, uh, it sets up a, a variable field. Um, and then you have this magnet moving within that variable um, magnetic field that's produced by the coil. Right. So, um, yeah, very interesting. 1925. Uh, another interesting uh, bit of history, I don't think I have it pulled up here, but uh, uh, Edward Kellogg also is the inventor of the electrostatic transducer. And uh, I think it wasn't long after... Um, doing the dynamic loudspeaker that he came up with the electrostatic transducer. And I thought I had that patent pulled up here, but I don't see it at the moment. So I guess, and we're not really ta talking uh, about electrostat, so I guess we'll just kind of move on. So, you know, there were some really um, uh, influential people that, uh, uh, took this type of design and improved upon it. Um, you know, maybe the next person to talk about, um, you know, might be James B. Lansing, uh, because he was really focused on trying to get better sound quality out of the dynamic loudspeaker and uh, and interestingly enough this all occurred with the advent of um, uh, adding sound to movies uh, James Lansing originally started producing well even before he did movies he started building uh, loudspeakers in all, of all places Salt Lake City Utah for a local radio company and he was building uh, uh, transducers for uh, the local radio company that was producing radios. Um, just an interesting bit of of uh, trivia there. So, so then after that, um, he became involved in producing uh, loudspeakers for uh, cinema. Uh, it, it was sort of the advent of sound in cinema um, up to that point uh, a lot of talkies I, I think James Lansing was born in the early 1900s if I'm not mistaken so he but, founded um, Altec Lansing the company the speaker company from years ago right 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 yeah Altec hmm. Lansing um, and and then uh, it, which uh, eventually became um, the JBL speaker company yeah um, yeah, so he was very influential. Um, in fact, word was, as I understand, and, and really the history is on JBL's uh, website, so it's probably worth just going there and reading it yourself if, if any of your viewers have a specific interest. But um, he was contacted by the people that were not happy with the sound they were getting uh, for the early movies, early talkie movies, you know, with sound. And so they employed uh, James Lansing, who, by the way, uh, he did, his name was originally not James Lansing. He, he changed his name um, once he founded or uh, established the Lansing Sound Company. I'm not exactly sure where the name Lansing came from, but uh, uh, I, I should have this up here somewhere. Um, it was really interesting. Let's see. So his his initial name uh, was James Martini. He was born oh, okay. in uh, January. Martini. James Martini. I like that. James Martini. Yeah. And so he changed his name once he'd established um, the Lansing company. But uh, to, to move on, so he, he was very um, 
very successful in his endeavor to make better sound for movies. Right. And, um, and, and then you have, so he was certainly one of the, um, one of the icons of the industry, no doubt about it. And then you have uh, people like Edgar Vilcher, um, who was behind the design of the acoustic suspension loudspeaker. That's through acoustic research, right? Yeah, and uh, the company eventually, um, he paired up with one of his students, Henry Kloss, and, and uh, AR Loudspeakers was born uh, from their collaboration. Yeah, anyway, um, I'm fascinated by the history uh, of what happened to develop you know, everything from the beginning to where we are today, a lot of really influ influential people uh, made a big difference in the technology, uh, but also not only the technology, but uh, bringing good sound to the masses. And, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of those people to thank. I don't, what about yourself? Were there, um, can you think of any products or, uh, you know, uh, maybe designers or engineers in particular that uh, you might have been aware of in your younger days that sort of brought you more into the audio industry? Yeah, you know, like I, when, when I was in high school, I, I always liked audio. I mean, from when I was a kid, my brothers would have these big systems with 12-inch woofers. Uh, there were like a house brand in New York called Lafayette, Lafayette or Criterion was the, the brand that they distributed. And I used to love just seeing the woofers move, man, when they had those big paper cones, 12-inch cones, and you could actually smell that paper. I don't know what kind of paper they used back then, but I love the <laughs> smell of the paper. But um, I was obsessed with sound as a kid, and I knew one day that I would have a system that would rival anything that any of my brothers ever had because I knew it's what I wanted to do. So growing up in high school, I... Um, I always strived for having something like a JBL L100 T3. That was, that's not this speaker, of course. Um, but I used to watch, I used to read the magazines like Stereo Review, and and I saw how they JBL built those um, L100 T3s with the 12 inch woofer in them and the titanium tweeter. But I couldn't afford a speaker like that, which at, during the time was probably over a thousand bucks a pair. And now they still hold their value. People go crazy for vintage speakers. Yeah. So I started out in high school with Sorin Vegas. Um, I think the bigger model than this one, this is the D1 with an eight inch. I had the D2 with a 10 inch and I loved the red surrounds on the woofers and these speakers had great bass, but I listened to a lot of jazz and I recognized that this horn, um, had a very colored sound to it because I started getting more serious about audio and um, I would go to like sound advice. And at the time in Florida, there was a high end store called Leechmere, and I would listen to the infinity line. Um, infinity was making some really nice speakers and I eventually settled on finding a pair of JBLs that I could afford. They made an LX series that was like the L 100s, but maybe not as dynamic and, had an eight inch woofer instead of a 12. So I endured working at Publix a whole summer when I was 15 years old and I hated the job. I was a bagger and I had to take groceries out for people and I had to clean bathrooms and, and they made you do everything back then. So <laughs> I waited, I waited until the end of the summer when I had $400 cash on me and I went to Circuit City and I'm like, these are the speakers I want. Yeah. And they were an eight inch three way with a titanium tweeter. Notice there's no rubber dampening surround on this tweeter. This was pure titanium. There was no uh, rubber edges like you see now on metal dome tweeters. Uh -huh. um, this was like the early stages of, of hard dome tweeters. So I'm sure there was an oil can resonance in this tweeter that was not flattering, but right. it had a lot of sparkle that, and a lot of clarity that my Sermon Vegas simply didn't have. I mean, it destroyed those speakers in terms of accuracy and it allowed me to listen to jazz music and do justice to it. And um, yeah, so I think that was, that was what really got me into audio. I kept these things throughout my high school and throughout college. 
And I went on to like maybe one or two other brands until I found you guys. Uh -huh. And I have to say that I had kind of an epiphany um, when you sent me those decimos. This is not the finish I have. I have mine in black. But mm -hmm. this speaker kind of really opened my eyes. It actually put a tear down my cheek when I first had them set up in my room. Mm -hmm. And just how they visually, they sonically disappeared. Like they just imaged like no other speaker I ever heard. Um, I've always liked to have big speakers, but then I realized, you know, a speaker that's done right uh, with a subwoofer can sound like a big speaker, but it also has the magic of disappearing because it's got such a, a small baffle like the speaker. Right, right. So, and there was a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on in the speaker that, you know, it got me thinking, well, why, why does this speaker have, you know, an aluminum cone and a, don't, a very expensive textile dome tweeter why didn't you just use you know paper you still see paper in the pro audio market you still see paper and a lot of drivers um you know obviously there's different grades of paper um right you don't see like bose kind of cube speakers the thin paper versus what you see in pro audio with the jbl woofers that are really stiff and yeah. definitely different grades of paper but it got me thinking it's like um you know, there's got to be pros and cons to different driver materials, and, and it has to affect the sound to some extent. So I think it's a good idea to talk about this with you, and I know it's a pretty broad topic, mm -hmm. but I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts on why do you guys, for example, use aluminum cones and not just use, you know, polypropylene or, or a, a paper cone or or even a Kevlar cone. I know BMW used Kevlars for years. What was your reasoning? Why do you like um, metal dome or metal cone drivers? Yeah, okay. Well, great question. Um, let me <clears throat> kind of take you through a little bit of my uh, 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 history leading up to getting to that metal cone driver. So <clears throat> my father... Uh, it was an avid, still is, an avid audiophile. And um, I'll show you what I grew up on uh, for a loudspeaker system for a number of years in my childhood. Okay, this should be coming up on your screen. Oh, yeah, Macintosh, huh? Yeah, this is the infamous hmm. Macintosh ML4. Now... I've got an interesting story because this is something that's for sale somewhere. I can't remember what this was off of eBay or something like that. But it needs uh, new surrounds on those workers, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. But I tell you what, this was just an amazing speaker system back in the '70s, and uh, you know it had four 12-inch woofers. Um, it had uh, eight-inch midwoofer. You know, these are all paper cone. Then it had some textile uh, dome mid ranges. You can see four of them in here. And then it had a few tweeters and a, or super tweeters, something to to that effect. And uh, so this speaker system, uh, I was just fascinated with for several reasons because my dad would play these speakers loud enough to bring the plaster down in my bedroom, which was underneath <laughs> his listening room. Literally. I mean, he, he would put on the 1812 Overture, and when those cannons went off, the plaster would start coming down uh, <laughs> off of my ceiling in my bedroom. So, you know, I, I was fascinated by um, just the power of the speaker system. So was that, was that two channels or was that one channel? Yeah. No, it's two channels. So this is just one speaker, but he, it was a two channel system. Two of these. So speakers. there must have been a ton of comb filtering going on with all those tweeters. Uh, and... You know, that's <clears> before <throat> the days of real imaging, obviously. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was just it, they did have a really good balance to them, though. You know, they sounded very natural. Yeah, there wasn't much of a sound stage, but but boy, did they have the dynamics um, that just most other speakers didn't even come close to in that day and age. Uh, so, you know, it, it was a good start for me. Um, 
And uh, I think this is one of Russell Rogers' designs at Macintosh, if I'm not mistaken. And, and um, you know, it, it was just, it was really a step uh, in the direction that I, I found I always wanted to go with a loudspeaker system and, or loudspeaker system design. And so paper cones. And interestingly enough, here's another story. I brought over some friends to, to our, my house as a teenager to play this speaker system for them. Uh, and I put on the 1812 Overture. And, you know, back in those days, you had to have a really good turntable and needle to track those cannon shots. I mean, they were just really something. Uh, on, you could see them on the record. They were so big. Um, and so I put it on. And here comes the first cannon shot, and boom! All of a sudden, the woofers in my dad's system all looked like this. They had literally launched. <laughs> <laughs> and the surrounds, there was enough force in that first cannon shot, and the surrounds, I guess, which were foam surrounds, had, had gotten old enough, they'd been stretched enough uh, by use and abuse that they just literally came apart. You know, and so that was the end of those speakers. I, I basically did them in. But um, so moving on from here, um, yeah, you know, paper was the cone choice of uh, the material of choice, uh, really the only thing that people were using back in those days. And then you had, um, you know, the advent of some companies like Infinity. Uh, one of the first, if not the first, to use the polypropylene cone woofer. And they used also Kapton in their uh, uh, emit tweeters and their MM uh, mid-range drivers. So they, they really forwarded uh, a lot of tech, driver technology at that point. And there, there were a number of others that were sort of on the same track at that time. Well, one but, thing to consider when you, when we made that shift from a speaker like this that had paper cones versus the infinity that had the polypropylene cones. Um, I bet you this speaker had a very high sensitivity. Uh, yeah, yeah, relatively high. Um, although I think it was, you know, tuned for that bottom end. So I remember uh, there was an equalizer that came with the system. And, and my dad had the MC2300 amplifier, which was a whopping 300 watts per channel. And he eventually went to the 2500, which had 500 watts per channel. And, and uh, a lot of power for back then. That was a lot of power for back then. And yet you would see the needles on those Macintosh amps peg over well on the mc2500 it you know topped out at a thousand watts supposedly and uh so you know it, it takes a lot of power to produce you know loud spls and and i really don't know what the sensitivity rating on those speakers was my guess is it was probably in the upper 80s uh maybe mid to upper 80s uh but but still um yeah, there were a number of developments that took place, uh, you know, again, using stronger magnet materials, which Infinity also did. Um, you know, you had, uh, you had Arnie Nudell and Kerry Christie and uh, John Ulrich, who started Infinity, and, and they had, they were all, well, at least I know John and uh, Arnie, were were engineers and so uh they they had uh, uh spent a lot of time really thinking about what could be done to uh, to advance loudspeaker technology and design so so then all of a sudden you had speakers like the infinity irs system i know what you're talking about you're talking about the the kind of the towers with the transparent yeah. cones yeah exactly had the transparent yeah. polypropylene cones um, so then you had this, it, it took dynamics to even a, a, another level. Um, and, you know, again, amazing, unique listening experience. I still remember hearing those at, at uh, Infinity's booth, uh, the consumer electronic 
show 25, 30 years ago, whenever I first started going to the shows. And um, yeah, it, it was just, it was really impressive in terms of the dynamics of the system and, and also how accurate it was. I, I think, um, uh, you know, initially that system had, you know, really, um, really good frequency response, very linear. Uh, in part because they were using uh, servo technology and the woofers and um, and of course all those diaphragms certainly helps uh, as far as with drivers uh, making sure you're uh, looking at low distortion for the loudspeaker system um, so well, but one thing I, I you know just to thinking about this again when you when you're dealing with the different cone materials like the paper versus these poly cones mm -hmm. i'd have to i'd have to say that sensitivity is probably compromised somewhat when you go with a different cone material than paper because paper seemed to be the yeah. most efficient kind of cone material especially when you didn't have a lot of wattage to deal with yeah you know um i i think there's merit to what you're saying although it's interesting, uh, it, one of the later cones that Infinity came out with, I think this was still during Arnie Nudel's time, if I'm not mistaken, but they did the IMG cone. This is the injection molded graphite, which is still extremely uh, light and stiff, uh, had, had better rigidity uh, by quite a bit than, than what paper cones were back in that day, but it also had better self-damping characteristics. So, you know, and that kind of brings us, I guess, to, to, you know, what is it that really matters in a cone material or dome material in a driver? Well, you need to maintain pistonic motion. That's the number one thing. That's what a driver is supposed to do. It's attached to the voice coil. In fact, I think I've got one here somewhere I can hold up. So in other words, you want that driver to move linearly in and out, you know, with signal. You don't want it to be bending and flexing and is what you're saying, right? Exactly. And so, you know, you, you have a voice coil. Um, the uh, current through the voice coil is uh, interacting with the fixed magnet that produces the force that moves the cone forward and backward. And so you're supposed to maintain that linearity of motion as the, the um, uh, cone or diaphragm material uh, essentially creates a pressure wave in the air, um, pressurizing the air and then on the forward stroke and on the uh, back stroke, the rarefaction or uh, decrease in pressure. And if that propagates um, the acoustic, uh, energy propagates through the air until it reaches our ears. So, keeping this cone rigid and pistonic is a, a big part of the challenge of making sure we have good frequency response, linear frequency response in a dynamic driver. Now, I'm just gonna show you a few different cone materials. Um, now, let me ask you, Shane, while you're doing that, let me ask you a question. If you go up to a speaker, don't even turn it on. Uh huh. Correct me if you, if you think I'm wrong. If you go up to a, a woofer and you push, lightly push on it with your finger at any part of that cone, it shouldn't be flexing, right? When you, when you go to the outer edges of the cone where the, where the uh, surround is, if yeah. that cone is really linear and stiff, you should be able to push on the cone in that area and the whole cone itself should move. It shouldn't... You shouldn't see visible correct. flexing, right? Now, ideally, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. That is what we should be getting. And it is what we get in modern day cone materials. For instance, you know, this is one of our aluminum cones, goes in one of our woofers and it is darn rigid. I mean, there is just no flex in the very, again, uh, there's, there's physics behind this. We can talk about uh, uh, the measurement of stiffness in a material, Young's modulus. Yeah. Uh, that, that maybe is going a little bit beyond where we need to go for this video, but it, it, there are ways to measure stiffness or rigidity within uh, a cone material. And 
um, you know, if you, you even go back to say this, I'll show, I, <clears throat> hopefully we can see sort of the difference between here's uh, this polypropylene. Um, and graphite this, injected uh, one, yeah. Injected graph, uh, yeah, graphite. And um, it still has a fair amount of flex to it. Well, there were things that came after that. I wanted to see if I had a, yeah. Here's a fiberglass cone. Uh, here's, a, here's another polypropylene, just to give you an idea. You know, pretty flexible. Yep. Um, then we go to maybe a um, glass fiber cone. This one's even more flexible, honestly. It depends on how the cone is treated, but this one's really, oh yeah, <laughs> really bendy. Um, and then you can go to something more like, again, the aluminum cone, which is really quite stiff. And it's what we would call a rigid cone material. And there are a number of different materials that kind of fall into this category. But uh, at least in our case, as uh, um, how we have used this material, we found that this has really uh, good self-damping properties as well. And we, we, we'll talk about that more as we go into mid-range drivers. Well, that's the question I was going to ask you. If you have a cone that's stiff like that, it, it's going to have, it should have more of a resonant peak during breakup, right? It's not going to be dampened. Yeah. So how, yeah. are you control, how are you controlling that? Are you controlling it with the, with the crossover, a higher order crossover, question. or with the surround of the driver or doping or what? Yeah, great question. So let me see if I can pull up another graphic here that will hopefully help us to see. Because the argument I would say 10, 15 years ago, I would see in the press is you don't want to use aluminum cone drivers because they ring and you know, yeah. ringing is bad. And right. um, I remember going back and forth with those discussions with you back then and how yeah. some of that is you know, myth propagation. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you, you do have to be careful in how you design a rigid uh, cone material driver. Let me just see if I can pull up. Yeah. Yeah, my computer. So a cone that's stiffer than a cone that's not as stiff, it would have a, a more peaky breakup mode, but it would be higher in frequency too, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, that is potentially the case. And what I want to show you um, is this cone, just an example of what you're talking about uh, as far as controlling breakup mode. Okay, you've got to realize one of the primary determining factors for a breakup mode in a cone has to do with the, the speed of sound through the material or the propagation of the uh, uh, sound wave through the cone material. Um, that matters. Uh, with higher density materials, uh, higher rigidity materials uh, like metal cones, uh, whether it's aluminum, titanium, beryllium, it, you, have, um, you have an increased speed of sound through the actual cone material and the the initial breakup mode is determined in great part by that uh, that that uh, speed of sound through the material so and what one thing to realize too is when you look at speaker design from now versus 20 or 30, 30 years ago uh -huh. You guys, we, you didn't have the tools we have now to do the analysis. You didn't have finite element analysis to actually show, you know, the cone breakup modes or the distortions that, that these breakup modes cause. You didn't have the computer simulation software to more precisely design crossover networks, right? So, I mean, you, right. have, better, you have better tools now to understand and identify these kind of problems. Right. Absolutely. So... Going back to your question uh, of, yeah, how is this dealt with? I mean, uh, prominent breakup mode. This is an aluminum cone, and uh, you, this is actually a six and a half inch mid-range driver. 
you can see there's a prominent breakup mode here and um, the driver is actually suffering from some non-linearity even below that breakup mode. And uh, it, so this is a, what I would call a poorly designed aluminum cone or metal cone uh, mid-range. And, and honestly, there's a number of them even still out on the market. Yeah, so don't, don't assume just because a company uses an aluminum cone driver that all aluminum cone drivers are designed equally good. Yeah, that, that's very true. And, and here's the thing. This is a cone that I have experimented with, okay? So it's the, the cone, the comparison to what we are currently using, this is our current aluminum cone driver. And you notice the, the breakup mode is shifted up in frequency. It's quite a bit down in comparison to the other um, cone, you know, with a real prominent breakup. It's more linear as it uh, uh, reaches the top of its pass band um, and it enters into the stop band. So if you use the right damping, uh, on the aluminum cone and the right cone shape, then you can do a lot to increase the self-damping properties of the cone that, that help it maintain really good linearity and, um, and make it much easier to deal with. Now, and then this is actually um, the driver with the crossover. Uh, so th this is, you know, just a second order crossover that I believe probably uh, close to the 3K range. And, uh, and even so, if I was to measure this without the crossover, you would see an even increase in this breakup. Yeah, I was going to say the breakup mode doesn't look like it's as big as it should be. So, so you have a, you have a crossover on both of those, right? Because the roll off. Yeah, it, it's the exact same crossover, exact same voice coil and motor structure. The only difference is the type of uh, aluminum cone and the damping on the cone. Oh, so, I got gotcha. you. So, um, let me, uh, I'm going to go back so I can show you just some of the things that make a difference with this. Uh, so, so, to under, so the reader to under, or the viewer to understand this, a breakup mode is something you want to avoid because that's the thing they talk about when you talk about ringing or audible distortion or honkiness in the sound or any yeah. kind of anomaly that when you see that kind of thing in the audio band, especially around two kilohertz, because our ears are most sensitive between, you know, a couple of hundred hertz and three or four kilohertz. That's the critical kind of voice band. So right. we hear those kind of distortions more than you would hear distortions in bass frequencies. True. Absolutely. Um, and just to give you an example of what, you have to do to deal with uh, that type of uh, breakup anomaly that can be really unpleasant when you hear it uh, because it, it's not harmonically related to the signal going into the driver. Um, so, you know, oftentimes you can hear harmonics, uh, even order harmonics that uh, might, you know, they're just not offensive, but an odd order harmonic uh, can sound somewhat grating. And then you have a non-harmonic related breakup mode that is, is even worse. And so it's sort of the worst case scenario. If you don't have um, a rigid cone material damped properly. So now I'm going to show you, I've, I've got, might have to back up so we can see this here. So these are two identical cones. This is the cone by itself. Now, I want you to hear this. I'll probably have to hold it to my uh, mic on my lapel. Can you hear that? Can you hear that ringing? Oh my God, do that again. It's almost like a yeah. bell. Yeah, I can't believe, I thought, I thought that was just like you hitting the microphone or something. But yeah, that's crazy. That's how much this rings. It, it, and again, 
Aluminum is actually pretty darn good at, at, in terms of self-damping characteristics compared to a lot of other uh, stiff metals um, in the uh, spectrum. But now I have the same cone that has a surround on it and it has been treated on the back with um, a special type of damping material. I'm going to do that same little flick test on this cone. Yeah, no, no, no ringing, ringing anymore. No ringing. Okay, now granted this is a woofer, but still you, you can tell there's a dramatic difference in the type of um, you know, ringing characteristics. One rings like crazy, the other doesn't. So let's talk about that. Um, again, damping material on the back of the driver, which what we do is proprietary to our products. There are a lot of aluminum cones out there that do not have any damping on the back of them. Wow. Therefore, they will be more prone to ringing. But the other thing is making sure you use the proper surround material. So I am- and now, Nowadays, they don't use the old foam uh, or the, they still use foams, but they're not the ones that dry rot after a couple of years. They've, they've gotten a lot better with the foams, but you typically use a butyl rubber, right? Well, let me show you. Yes, oftentimes a butyl rubber. So I'm gonna see, hopefully I can point this down so you can see uh, this little demonstration I'm gonna give you. Here is a, a butyl rubber uh, ball. It's made out of the same type of butyl rubber that goes into a typical surround. You get a feel for how yep. that um, reacts. Now here is the, uh, it's a synthetic rubber compound that we use in our cones. Mm, it doesn't bounce as much. Yeah, not not even close to. Yeah, so what's happening is is this material is uh, very effective at uh, reducing those reflections that go up the cone that cause the ringing, uh, potential ringing um, of a stiff, rigid cone material, and so. Uh, you know, between the damping on the back of the cone and the surround material, you can greatly uh, linearize and, and uh, reduce any, you know, uh, really nasty breakup mode uh, issues. So now these, these are two metrics in cone design that the average user or the average consumer going to shop for speakers there's no way of him knowing looking at speaker A versus speaker B. This is kind of a, maybe an engineering secret that you're divulging here. Yeah. Um, I well, guess I, I would say in, in our industry, it's not necessarily a secret. Most people know it can be done. The question is, will they go to the extra effort and or cost to make sure it is done? So there's really no way for the average Joe to go and look at speaker A versus speaker B and say, you know what, these both have aluminum cones, but one of them has the proper proprietary damping um, material that's doping the driver behind the driver. It's not in front of the driver. You don't typically see it in front. And right. they don't know what kind of butyl rubber surround, what kind of dampening properties. So, I mean, the only way to really know is other than listening, obviously, is to, is to basically have a set of measurements. Correct. Because you know, yeah. this kind of stuff shows up in measurements. Yeah. And if your cones are ringing, you're going to see this in amplitude response errors, basically. Correct. Yeah, amplitude and time. Um, you know, if, if uh, you have ringing and you look at the, um, let's see, I think I have a, graph here that shows the, the waterfall plot um, of one of our products. Yeah, let me uh, share this with you. So another, another thing I'm wondering is when you design a driver like this that's properly damped, 
Does it allow you to use less aggressive crossover networks, less aggressive yeah. deepness in the filters, less yes. losses as yeah. a result? Yeah, yeah, uh, because typically uh, you, you know, you're having to come up with uh, some type of network. If you have a, a rigid comb material that has a bad breakup mode, uh, you'll see that not only in the amplitude response, but the time domain, uh, how, how the driver settles over time with an impulse. Um, and so, uh, you know, you want that to be relatively smooth. Here you can see, uh, and this is, uh, you know, from the tweeter on down, right down into, you know, as you get into the woofer range, you've got mass uh, factoring in that causes, uh, you know, a little extra energy over time. But uh, ideally, you want to maintain, you know, this very uh, controlled and uniform uh, damping of the drive of all of the drivers over time. So uh, you wouldn't see that if, if we were to take the same measurement of a uh, metal cone driver, for instance, that had a, a prominent breakup mode, that high Q mode would also be apparent in, um, in the waterfall plot and you would see a, a lot more uh, reverberation happening over time. So it right. take a lot longer for the, for the driver to settle at those frequencies. <clears throat> So, I mean, that, it kind of makes sense when you think about 20 years ago or so when, when these metal driver, when these metal dome and metal cone drivers were coming on the market and they were getting a bad reputation. Um, it kind of makes sense, kind of like when you think about when CDs first came out, people thought, you know, analog sounded better than digital. Um, we're talking about the early stages of digital. We're talking about the early stages of metal cones that weren't properly damped, that were actually ringing and turning people off well and i'll tell you um interestingly enough when i uh 25 years ago first started with rph and and uh there there was one other metal cone product out on the market that i was aware of that i i got a hold of and i measured it and i was shocked <laughs> because you know you, the the aura of metal cone being superior and providing better frequency response, better overall, you know, uh, performance, I could see from the measurement that was not the case. It was just terrible, terrible ringing. And in order to tame that, again, you would have to have some type of uh, circuit in your crossover to be able to address that uh, a notch filter essentially is what you would have to have and designing notch filters uh, you know that are very uh, narrow band with uh, the ability to take that ringing out is is difficult to do uh, and it honestly just doesn't work that well I, I tried uh, myself a number of times as we were first developing our metal cone drivers, but then, then it came down to finding sort of the magic sauce or, or recipe for dealing with the damping on a mechanical level, constrained layer damping, that kind of thing, um, that would address it without having to address it in the crossover uh, and the electrical range or spectrum. So, yeah, it looks like you're put pulling up something to yeah yeah no i hear yeah i hear what you're saying i was just wanted to basically also show this article that we did on identifying legitimately um high fidelity parts and loudspeakers it's kind of relating to our discussion uh -huh. um, about the comb materials and and what constitutes a good driver from a bad driver and of course it's not always just you know the most expensive parts used in a driver you can use you could put good parts into a speaker and still have a bad sound if it's not executed correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I'll tell you <laughs> the cone. Um, well, the cone material uh, that I was showing that resonance that occurred uh, that cone particular cone 
costs, you know, over double uh, what our cone cost for us to source. And so it, it's, um, yeah, money, spending the <laughs> higher amount of money does not always guarantee you're getting, uh, you know, the performance you want. Now, the, the nice thing about any rigid cone material, and really there are a number of different materials that fall into that category. Uh, you know, you've got uh, the ceramic cones, beryllium, uh, titanium even falls into that category. But again, you have to be careful with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of rigid materials can have even worse ringing properties if they're too stiff. And, and so you have to be careful about how you, you uh, address those. But when adequately uh, engineered and designed to uh, take those things into account, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, and yeah, there's a picture of our beryllium phase plug uh, midwoofer. And so that is actually an alloy. It's not pure beryllium. Uh, it also contains aluminum as well as some other metals and yeah uh, on that, the mid range that, yeah and it does have uh, it has sort of a softer um, breakup mode characteristic even than our aluminum driver uh, it's a, just a little bit warmer sounding uh, it's a lighter cone so it's uh, if you're looking for something that does primarily you know a mid woofer that will do a lot of bass, it's not necessarily the best option to go with because it's, um, uh, it's lighter. And sometimes you want a little more mass um, to sort of balance out what you're doing with uh, you know, more massive uh, voice coil uh, in the motor structure. So uh, there are a lot of factors that go into, um, you know, making sure you're either designing or choosing the right driver to give you the kind of performance you want. Well, now, let, let me ask you this though. Now, um, obviously this is a consumer based product uh -huh. and, and I know aesthetics do play a role in, in loudspeakers. You know, um, you want things to look good. You want things to look fancy and exotic, but when you go to the commercial market and you look at pro audio and you look at, um, you know, like line array kind of speakers and, I know the design goals are different in pro audio because they're designing to give you the maximum sensitivity and the maximum output per watt. True. True. So is that why, is that a primary reason why you see pro audio still using traditional paper drivers, at least not, not in the high frequency driver, but in the yeah. mid drivers and the base drivers, is that why they're still using papers because that's the biggest bang for the buck highest sensitivity kind of material you yeah, could really it, That is the trade-off, uh, yes. Uh, some of it will have to do with cost as well. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, I would say that that is the primary reason. Uh, you know, I've done some design work uh, here. We have at RBH on some commercial products and, and we are using uh, in some of those products, we've used paper cones. Um, we really haven't used paper cones in any of the rest of our um, consumer-grade products for years and years and years. So, uh, yeah, you know, there can be reasons, and it just depends on the, the end you're trying to accomplish. So here you're showing... Yeah, the difference uh, in the velocity between materials, the density, the uh, Poisson ratio, ratio, which is uh, a ratio that uh, basically gives you an idea of how stresses affect the material. Uh, if it's stressed in one direction uh, or stretched, how does that affect the other dimensions of the material? Um, and, and so all of these things factor in. Um, and, you know, beryllium is a great material overall. And, of course, diamond has a really high velocity. 
that's a bit expensive to use. <laughs> yeah, but in a, in a tweeter, um, you know, there can be advantages uh, to yeah. going with it because you know, you've got relatively small amount of material, and there are companies out there uh, that use diamond type materials, and uh, we use the beryllium tweeter. The speaker you have has a beryllium uh, tweeter in it in your reference system. And that's pure beryllium. That's not a, a vapor pure, deposit, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that's true. And um, there are relatively few producers of uh, pure beryllium uh, cones or domes out there. And uh, in fact, interestingly enough, uh, a good goodly portion of the beryllium that is used uh, in products um, here in the U.S. comes from Utah. <laughs> no. Mine here in Utah. So, um, so you think like you think like the drivers that uh, Revel use with the beryllium tweeter and TAD uses with their beryllium cones. You think that a uh, big portion of that is coming from Utah? The the materials, the raw yeah, materials. Well, I, I don't know for sure, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case because uh, Brush Wellman or what was formerly Brush Wellman, um, the company that is now doing that. Um, uh, type of material, they are still using uh, those mines as sources for their beryllium. And so, yes, it's very possible some of those beryllium domes uh, or cones, the material is originating uh, just outside of Delta, Utah at, uh, at the mine here. So, they also uh, use the they also use beryllium to power the warp drive in the Galaxy Quest ship too, the beryllium spheres. So, oh, well, that's <laughs> you're on a completely different level with yeah, uh, yeah. With, I, I I laughed when I saw that movie because I always you know think back to audio when I hear these kind of materials being thrown around. But yeah, but no, there's something to be said about exotic materials. The other thing that factors in, uh you know, or the forces that are produced, you know, that you have to account for. Um, you think about the, the type of acceleration a driver material has to uh, undergo or, or um, you know, be able to withstand when it's producing, you know, 20,000 hertz, uh, you know, um, the frequency, that kind of frequency. I know roughly, just as an idea, I think at 60 hertz, um, you know, for a woofer, you're having to, to uh, the driver material is having to withstand about 65, 70 Gs worth of force um, uh, moving back and forth. So it's, yeah. You know, it, when you have a more rigid material, uh, you don't have the the deformation um, or bending or flexing of the material, and you maintain that pistonic surface area. Um, if you don't maintain that pistonic surface area, you have essentially what is compression, along with other types of distortion uh, that can occur. Uh, but y you can get some, yeah, really unpleasant things happening, which affect the sound of the driver. Uh, you may not hear the dynamics the way they would should sound, or they would sound with a rigid cone material. Um, and you know, there, there are a lot of people that are, are a lot of different companies that are using those types of products these days. And uh, some of them are, are no doubt very good drivers. And, and some of them may not have been engineered quite to the nth degree and they may still have some some issues uh, well that's you know that's an interesting point you make about the forces on the driver that's a good reason why we don't use you don't see paper tweeters yeah yeah uh it, it's true because uh unless you're unless you uh make speakers for a company that be, begins with the letter b and ends with the letter e <laughs> well and and here's the thing it, it is true that you can dope just about any type of uh, diaphragm material, or dome material, to to withstand, you know, so that it is, is functioning better. Um, but um, 
you know, it's sometimes harder to do the doping process still to a degree that will even bring you close to uh, some of the other more exotic materials that are used in drivers these days. Okay. So we know that stiffness is a good thing in driver material. It helps with linearity of the driver. We know that really stiff drivers can have pretty nasty breakup modes unless the driver itself is properly damped with what you showed us by dampening the cone material and also using a proprietary kind of uh, surround that helps damping it. We know that doing so will allow you to use a more simplistic crossover so you don't have to worry about the resonances caused by the drivers themselves or you don't have to filter as much out-of-band nasties as you would with a cone that's breaking up. Correct, yes. So the next question I have for you, I guess, is not just the exotic materials whether they matter or not but also the kind of things that we do to high frequency drivers um you know there's always a debate soft dome, soft versus hard dome cone materials for dome materials for tweeters yeah. but also whether they use a flat face plate or if they use a wave guide so right. i'd like to kind of i guess i'd like to just try to talk about those two topics um okay there's always people saying, you know, don't ever use a hard dome tweeter because they resonate. And then there's, there's a camp that says, you know, why would you use a soft dome fabric that's not linear because it's not a stiff material like a titanium right. or like an aluminum? Why the heck are we still using fabric dome tweeters in that case? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So if we go back to where you can see, um, I can tell you it, when it comes to tweeters, and, and it is true that um, what applies to a woofer or maybe a mid-range doesn't necessarily apply to a tweeter. It, it's just a little different scenario because you have uh, smaller masses um, and you don't have some of the... Um, same kind of forces acting on the driver um, in quite the same way. So, you know, there's some great, very rigid cone woofers out there that maintain very pistonic uh, operation, uh, especially with certain types of doping. Um, once you get up into the higher frequencies, again, it, it's you have to have. Um, sort of a different approach sometimes with materials. Now, like you said, a lot of times you may have a, uh, in this case is an aluminum dome tweeter. Uh, usually you'll have a breakup mode at some point, you know, above 20,000 Hertz, preferably, um, that you're going to get, again, due to the actual speed of sound through the material which is uh, uh, in part great part um, the reason for that breakup mode happening but also the the uh, shape or uh, geometry of the dome uh, that's being used so this type of dome in order to maintain uh, the stiffness has to be flatter then say this dome, which is a fabric dome, a treated fabric dome, it maintains um, a more uh, rounded profile to it. Mm -hmm. You can't really do that with uh, this type of material, this uh, aluminum type material, because otherwise you end up with some real nasty oil can type resonances. And anybody that Hopefully, people will understand that uh, oil can type resonance is when something sort of pops back and forth. If you have, you may have even uh, seen it in other uh, products that are metal products where you have a real loud pop, is maybe you've got a can like a soda can, and uh, you can pop that back and forth. That's kind of what we're talking about an oil can resonance. Um, so they're very prominent, really nasty, and we want to try to avoid them if at all possible. You don't get that type of resonance in a fabric dome tweeter. So 
there's some really high performance fabric dome tweeters out there that are doped in a manner that they have just actually very rigid, uh, relatively rigid response for, for a fabric uh, at those higher frequencies. Again, much lower moving mass, and, and that mass is a big determining factor as to what the overall bandwidth will be of the driver itself. So you want less mass again for more high frequencies? Ideally, yeah, the l less mass, the better. Uh, basically, the less mass, the more extended frequency response you'll have. Now, that, that kind of covers domes, but then we can get into more exotic realms of uh, tweeter uh, type drivers. For instance, this is our air motion transformer type tweeter where uh, it's not, it's, it's using a different type of motion to, uh, to mechanically transform the energy from mechanical motion to acoustic energy. Um, this squeezes the air versus moving the air back and forth the way a uh, traditional dome type tweeter might. might What's that? Out. Is that made out of mylar or is that a... Is yeah, this is a mylar material. This mm -hmm. one is a mylar <clears throat> material. Uh, there are other types of materials that are used often. This is a mylar with a, an aluminum uh, conductor through it. But, um, <clears throat> well, I'm starting to lose my voice here. I better take a little sip of water. That's not water. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's got something in it to keep me uh, still going. I mean, I, I'm trying to keep up with Batman here. Yeah. For those that don't know it, Gene Della Sala does most of his work after midnight. That's true. While, while Batman fights crime, I fight uh, snake oil in the industry. There we go. <laughs> Although I wouldn't be surprised if you're actually out fighting crime at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, where were we uh, talking about? You're talking about an AMT, basically. Yeah. So there, you know, then there are ribbon drivers, which a lot of ribbons or a, a aluminum, um, just an aluminum diaphragm that's moving air. Uh, I shouldn't say moving air; they really don't move air. It's creating a pressure uh, wave. Uh, there's not much air that they move. We'll put it right. that. We're propagating, we're creating a pressure wave and that propagates through the air. Um, so yeah, very light, um, can have very linear response, uh, but there's always seem to be trade-offs with, with different types of uh, drivers. You know, uh, driver, uh, for instance, a, a ribbon driver, because of its very low mass, again, has very extended frequency response, uh, but it doesn't do low frequencies very well. It can have some nasty breakup modes in the low frequency range um, and, and is just uh, less capable of being able to be crossed over at lower frequencies. So you have to be careful of that. Um, so that means you have to use a mid-range driver that has a wider bandwidth at that point. Correct, correct. And, you know, there are plenty of great speaker products out there that do just that. They shift the crossover frequency up a little higher. Um, you have to be, then be careful with the kind of dispersion that your mid-range driver is giving you at those higher frequencies. It typically uh, won't be as good as a smaller driver like a tweeter. Yeah, correct. And so, again, it's making sure you're doing your best to balance all those variables in, in your speaker design. That's really what's going to make the difference. Um, you know, sometimes, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's the one thing I was going to ask you, too. Um, before I ask you this question, I was just kind of curious, that Metal Dome tweeter you showed us, why uh -huh. did it have, like, those, why did it have those, um, those, braces on it like those yeah, little... that, that's simply just to protect it from being pushed in there's really no acoustic reason for that oh okay i All thought those... it was to, to help break up a resonant mode or something yeah not not this one but there are 
uh, certainly a number, uh, and we produce some ourselves, uh, of uh, metal dome, or in our case, aluminum dome drivers that have um, a, a, essentially a phase plug type device, which again helps to, um, because the metal dome is a flatter dome, it typically starts beaming at higher frequencies that are closer to the uh, diameter of the uh, the driver dome itself. So having that there helps to disperse the higher frequencies uh, and, and prevent any beaming. Uh, so uh, there are other reasons to 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 go into that. And you talked about waveguides and that type of thing. Um, you know. And that's where, that's another thing I'm wondering too. Is I notice most of the tweeters that you use have a flat faceplate, um, but there are a lot of drivers on the market that actually use waveguides. And the theory behind why they use a waveguide, most of the time, you see manufacturers saying they use a waveguide to control the directivity of the driver so it matches better with the mid-range driver, gives you better integration between the two drivers. That but I think. Yeah, yeah. But I also think a lot of companies use waveguides um, as a way to extend the lower frequency limits of a driver that doesn't have enough motor force or enough uh, lower enough resonant frequency. So it's a way to take a cheap driver and extend its bandwidth so you could cross it over lower. What do you think yeah, about that? that? That's the other side of the coin. I mean, that is exactly, it's not always an inexpensive driver. Sometimes there's reason or rationale to even take a really nice driver and, and try and cross it over lower, um, depending on what your design parameters are. But yes, that can be done for sure. Uh, one of the ways that uh, oftentimes uh, a lower crossover frequency is achieved with a maybe a less expensive tweeter that has a higher resonance frequency is to um, essentially give it some loading with that waveguide or a horn, uh, some type of a horn um, uh, loading that will, will allow you to cross over at lower frequencies without, uh, you know, entering into as much distortion. Uh, the low end of the drive, uh, the tweeter itself. So yeah, th that is certainly the case. Um, I, you know, for us in our designs, it would just the quality of driver that we're using for the tweeter usually has uh, uh, afforded us the luxury of not having to use a waveguide to get, you know, the type of proper integration between the mid range and the tweeter that we want at the crossover frequency. Now, get the other reason that, again, companies, if they're trying to cut costs, they don't want to have um, as high an order of crossover on the tweeter. So instead of maybe a third or fourth order, they want to put a first order on there. Um, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll actually have, a value of capacitor that starts the crossover up higher on that tweeter, but it still allows enough low energy because of the waveguide or horn load that you're, you're getting still usable output at low frequencies so they can get away with maybe a first order uh, filter where otherwise you wouldn't be able to. Gotcha. So I guess, Shane, what I'm kind of wondering is, I, you know, I'm looking at some of the products behind you. You've got the SVTR tower. You've got a, looks like, that's not a subwoofer I've seen. That looks like a 1010, but no, is it a 12? Wait a minute. Why is there ports on the bottom of that? You're kind of confusing me now because your 1212 <laughs> has, the port, has the port underneath the box. Yes. You're tricking me here. You just, yeah. you've been, you planted that product there the whole time. And Would I give something like that to you, Gene? Man, you're teasing me, man. <laughs> uh, we know each other too well. Yes. Well, so I'm glad you caught on to that. It was, it was there for subliminal purposes. <laughs> it did its trick. So, yes, uh, that's actually uh, a new subwoofer that we are working on and will be released. Uh, we'll be showing it at the Cedia show. It'll be at our booth. And... Uh, 
uh, hopefully be in production relatively soon. Uh, so you know the performance of the, the 1212 and the SVTR. Well, the, the goal was to come up with something that could be really in that same type of performance category, but uh, at a lower, uh, lower price point. And um, so you can see the box or the enclosure on that is, is really pretty large, uh, but uh, it's got the two ports on the front. Um, some of our customers uh, want the vents on the front, especially if you're trying to put a subwoofer into a, uh, maybe a home theater system that has a baffle wall or is built in somewhere. So um, you can still do it with our 1212, but it's uh, just a little more challenging. You have to have an enclosure that uh, that fits the entire subwoofer, sort of a, a cubby or cabinet for it to go into because the port is on the bottom. So uh, yeah, we're excited about this product. Uh, excited to eventually uh, see if you'll want to get one in your hands as well. Uh, because it's going to have performance that will be very, very close uh, to to what the 1212 is right now. Well, the 1212 got our extreme baseaholic rating. It's one of the highest output subs um, that we've measured. It actually measured really well. Uh -huh. So um, is this going to be in the impression line? Uh, this is a different line. Um, it, what we're going to actually call it, remains to be seen. It, it uh, uh, is more uh, from a physical standpoint or the aesthetics of it, it's, it's more uh, along our S line of subwoofers. So we currently have an S8, S10, S12, and now this would be the S1212. So what do you think um, the original SX1212 that we reviewed back in 2014, that thing retailed for about five grand. Uh huh. Um, what are you looking at price wise? I mean, is this something that you've. Yeah, yeah great. Park? Yeah. Um, don't know exactly uh, that number yet, but, um, you know, the plan is to have something that will, at the very least, be. Uh, you know, probably come in at about half the price of that product. Nice. So now you can get two subs instead of one. Two there is you always go. better. Yeah. Yeah. Two is always better, my friend. <laughs> awesome. So, so back on to the subject of exotic driver materials. Do they make a difference in sound quality? Um, based on our discussion, I would say they can make a difference if they're properly designed, dampened. And well, they'll, they'll make a difference one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They will be different. And again, you know, there's a lot of neat cone materials out there. Uh, here's one. And I mean, one of the beauties of what I get to do as the technical director here at RBH is I get to test everything under the sun. And, and I've done that. I have a pile of about 30 different driver cones here. Right. And, uh, and so this one, for instance, is a carbon fiber uh, sandwiched in be uh, well, it's carbon fiber with glass fiber on the back uh, that has an aerogel type material. Extremely rigid, you know, really. Oh, wow, yeah. Material. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Even given all these, you know, fairly even newer exotic materials, I'll have to say that my personal preference is still the aluminum cone. That, that's just because I think in part we've refined it to the point that we have. It just seems to have the ideal um, balance of stiffness and damping properties that it just it's really hard to beat. And, and even things that come can come somewhat close to that type of performance or in the same category usually cost a lot more. And sometimes they're, they, 
they just don't have the same aesthetic appeal. Yeah. Now you mentioned that. I, I watched one of your previous videos where you, you mentioned how part of the experience, I, I, it seems like I remember you talking about naked drivers. Is that what you said? That was the speaker grill on or off. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Um, you know, the mind plays tricks with what you hear perceptually. And if I listen to a speaker with the grill on versus with the grill off, and it's not a controlled listening test, and I know what's going on, I always think it sounds better with the grill off, even if it doesn't, just because you can see the drivers. It's just kind of a, I'm a very tactile type of person. Even when I was a kid, I used to love seeing the woofers going in and out. And um, that's the one thing that always bothered, that's the one thing that always annoyed me about your speakers, because you put so much cone area in your drivers that they don't have to work very, they don't work very hard. <laughs> yeah. They barely move. So they don't, they're, they're not producing a lot of distortion, but they're also, you don't see the visual as much, which is a good thing because you don't want a driver. When you see a driver going in and out, it's, it's, it's not producing useful work as well as it would be if it wasn't being, <laughs> moving so much, right? You're right. And the funny thing is, is that I, I've been with you when I've actually seen you go up to the woofer. You can hear it, but because you haven't been able to see it moving, you weren't sure if it was really working. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you know, there, there is merit to what you're saying. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, um, it's one of those things where if the driver doesn't have to work as hard, that me you typically means you're, you've got lower distortion, you're spreading the load out of a, uh, you know, greater number of drivers, and um, uh, there's a benefit to that, obviously. But, um, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. It harkens back to watching those woofers and my dad's Macintosh speakers moving back and forth. Uh, that's one of the things that drew me into audio was, yeah. you know, wow, that's cool that, you know, that makes sound and, and uh, that that has the impact it does. So, you know what's interesting too, though, is back in those days, in the '70s and '80s, and even the '90s, a little bit, when we had these speakers with 12-inch woofers, 12-inch three-way drivers, whatever, they didn't do a lot to control the um, the the motion of the woofer. Like you were talking about how you blew the surrounds off those speakers because the excursion, right? Yeah. A lot of drivers today are self-damped, so you can't really do that. You can't buy. It's a lot harder to bottom out a six-inch woofer today than yeah. 30, 30 years ago. I mean, I, I used to bottom out those JBL eight inch three ways like it was nothing. Yeah. You take most, a JBL speaker today and it's not gonna bottom out because they just yeah. dampen the hell out of the drivers. Yeah, most engineers, designers uh, are, are designing drivers so that they have what we call a bumped back plate or extended back plate, which allows for more excursion. Um, you know, it used to be you could smack a voice coil against a back plate, uh, you know, quite frequently if you just had too much power. But anymore, uh, yeah, it, we, we're designing drivers so that e you're basically reaching the excursion limit of the driver long before you're going to smack that back plate. Um, and, and, you know, that makes a lot of sense because you don't want to damage, uh, you know, your driver, which you can do uh, without too much effort, with too much power. Yeah. Uh, driver, it, you know, if the the force on that driver is just, it have, is having to stop instantly <laughs> once you meet that uh, metal back uh, plate. So, right. yeah, it's... Um, Things have come a long way, honestly, I, I, you know, since, of course, the, the advent of the dynamic driver. But even in the last, I think, uh, 20 years, uh, there's some really neat things happening. And I think the next 20 years are just going to be <laughs> really incredible with, the, uh, you know, some of the new exotic materials, graphene, uh, you know, carbon nanotube, that type of thing. Um, it will be very interesting to see how things develop um, going forward. Especially we're going to have more active designs where you could do more interesting things with DSP processing and tailoring the sound of the speaker to the room. You know, I think yes. that's kind of the next frontier in loudspeakers. 
Yep. But I, I did want to just, you know, for anybody that's watching this video, I don't want anyone thinking that um, we're bashing speakers that have paper drivers because there are still awesome engineered speakers that use paper cones. And it's not the, the little flimsy paper that you see in the in your old TVs or, or in the little cube speakers. I'm talking about paper drivers like in the JBL Pro stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that are very rigid paper because they use a compound. It's not just paper. They probably use all these different exotic materials to form their mesh of, of yeah. whatever that cone is. Yeah, and, and, and that's true. I mean, and yet, I just from my experience, there seems to be something about the way um, those drivers release energy over time versus, you know, something that where this the energy is propagating through it uh, uh, much faster. Um, now, you know, you could probably approach. Uh, 10 different loudspeaker designers or engineers and, and have 10 different feelings about that. But um, I, I think, you know, there are still some great drivers that are using uh, pulp or paper type products. You know, one of the materials that uh, has actually been used real successfully is... Um, Not Kevlar, right? No, um, Nomex, Nomex material, which is essentially a type of dope paper. But I have uh, some cones somewhere here <clears throat> that use Nomex as uh, part of the structural reinforcement for um, a glass fiber cone or, or uh, you know, it's actually, it's, it's like the way corrugated cardboard is, you know, where it's got that that lattice of um, of structure that's supporting the cone, but Nomex, um, you know, is sort of a higher end uh, paper type product and is used in cones. Um, so th there's certainly still a place for things. And again, it just kind of depends on your your uh, design parameters. The the most highly sensitive driver. Uh, products out there are, 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 like you said, still going to be using paper. Right. Right. So there's always trade-offs to everything, my friends. Um, the, the lesson learned here is exotic materials do make a difference in speakers. Whether it's a good difference or a bad difference really de de depends on the execution of those materials and the execution of the system as a whole. And For sure. Unfortunately, you can't tell just by looking at a speaker. Obviously, listening tests are important, but um, looking at our reviews, we spent exorbitant amounts of efforts into accurately measuring loudspeakers. And in fact, I have um, some measurements here of a speaker that we reviewed for you guys. If I could, if I could stop with the, the Zoom thing sharing here, hold on a second. So this is the, from the impression line, um, we took your R55E tower <clears throat> on a platform outside to get it away from boundaries and we pulled some measurements on it. And, you know, I wasn't surprised to see that the speaker measured well and it's smooth and it's got good off axis performance. You don't see any resonances in the amplitude response. So no, you know, visual ringing that you would see with a driver that isn't properly damped. So uh -huh. overall, I thought the speaker measured really well. Uh -huh. And uh, it did well in our, in our review. And in our, we had kind of a face off of uh, four other speakers in this category that it competed very well with. So um, yeah, we try, you know, we try to do listening tests, critical listening tests for speakers, but we also try to get very accurate measurements to, to kind of categorize how the speaker is voiced or if there's any major problems with the speaker. You know, we found, you know, stupid stuff with speakers in the past that crossovers were wired in reverse and you'd see a suck out in the mid range driver or something like that. So measurements are useful to kind of weed that out. But right. um, yeah, you, you can't just go by the looks, my friends, because like, like Shane was saying, you can get, 
let's say a generic speaker on Amazon that's got aluminum cones in it and you say, well, it's got to be the same thing as an RBH that's five times the price. But then you think about the little details here. You know, yeah. all those- Unfortunately, <laughs> you can, it's much more easy to make a really bad speaker with a poorly designed aluminum cone um, just because of those inherent natural resonances that you may have to, that haven't been addressed quite possibly. So, you know, in the early days of metal cone drivers, they were not received real well and for good reason. Um, and, and, you know, again, yeah, there are plenty of manufacturers out there that are addressing things, uh, you know, the serious manufacturers, but you're right. There are a number of, inexpensive products out there that uh, probably are something you would not even want to <laughs> consider using. Uh, so just yeah. don't buy, don't, just don't buy a speaker from a van. If, if someone approaches you in a <laughs> van and they've got the deal of a lifetime and, and has the word digital on the box, uh, yeah. run, don't walk away from that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, you know, I, and in this day and age of a lot of internet sales, yeah, it, it may be a little bit harder to make sure you're you're really getting what you want as far as performance from the speaker, uh, because most of what sells the speaker these days is the way it looks and is presented on a website. Yeah. And so, you know, that's why we still value our dealers. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like kicking the tires of anything you're going to buy, whether it's a car or a speaker, you know, having the experience where you can experience it. Uh, now, that being said, there's great validation that comes from uh companies like your own audioholics that have gone through the efforts to to uh you know compare measure i mean those kind of things are invaluable so you know people can take if you go to a review site where they've done their homework and you hear them talking about some kind of comparison sometimes the measurements aren't there may not be as many measurements but at least hopefully they've compared it and they tell you how the speaker sounds, uh, you know, compared to something else in its class. Uh, if you don't hear anything about how it compares, be wary. Yeah. And, and, and then again, where, where you go to a site which has a number of measurements that also seem to coincide with what is being heard and the comparisons that are made, you know, you can take that to the bank. Yep. Yep. Uh, the little details matter, research matters. And, and in this case, exotic materials do make a difference. Good or bad is, is up to the, um, execution and how you like it. So I hope you guys enjoyed, I know it's a lengthy video and I wanted to make sure that we answered the question of the title of the video numerous times. But you know what? We could have you back on here, Shane, um, to address other speaker topics and uh, yeah. maybe even do more condensed videos. Maybe next time we'll set a timer. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you and I are conversing, we should have a timer, Gene. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got to go watch. I got to go watch Cobra Kai, man. I, I'm on like second season right now. I'm really enjoying that on, on YouTube. I'm just thinking about you know, Johnny fighting uh, Daniel LaRusso. It's actually a pretty good show for <laughs> original content. So I'll have to check that one out. That's one I haven't checked out yet. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's kind of on my mind right now. So anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Shane, thanks for joining us today and talking about speakers. And Yeah, thanks Zodic, for having me. Zodic Cone Materials. And my friends, um, if you like this content, please thumb it up. Subscribe to our channel. Join our Patreon channel. It's at patreon.com slash audioholics. We release this kind of content before it gets seen by everybody else on the YouTube channel. 
You could also interact with us and ask questions, or if you want us to have any particular topics to discuss on this channel, you could suggest it there. And I hope you guys enjoy this and value the speakers that you have in your house and think about the design and everything that went into them because there's a lot of thought often that goes into these products. So enjoy them, listen to some good music. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. All right, we are recording. Okay, get my get my game face on. <laughs> stretch out a little bit. Do your yeah. stretch, of Shane. <laughs> just don't start yeah. doing, just don't start doing the belly dance at that um, Moroccan place that we ate at. That would turn a lot of people off of your channel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat>